stop the madness. Baker Mayfield is not a better fit for the New Orleans Saints than Jameis Winston. We got all that and a little bit of land yap for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into this Wednesday episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. And I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. You can find me over at USA Today's Saints Wire, Tuesdays on Locked On NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. And on this Wednesday episode, we usually do our midweek fundamentals, and I wanted to come in and talk about post-June 1 transactions, all that, but we're going to delay that conversation to tomorrow. We'll do a little late week fundamentals because there was a conversation and there is a conversation that has been going on over the course of the last couple of days that's driving me absolutely nuts, and it's the conversation that the New Orleans Saints should pursue Baker Mayfield instead of of Jameis Winston in 2022. So I'm going to tell you why that's a terrible idea. I'm going to tell you why Jameis Winston is the better fit. If you don't want me to sit here and talk bad about Baker Mayfield, don't worry. I'll tell you situations in which Baker Mayfield would make sense. And we'll also talk about and get back to our offensive line breakdown in the NFC South to wrap up the show, looking at the raw numbers, who allowed the most sacks, most pressure, all of that. But first, we have got to kind of lay down the, 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 the situation here around this conversation when it comes to Jameis Winston and Baker Mayfield. You've seen it on the national level. My friends over at Locked on NFL talked about it today. James Rapine and Tony Wiggins. Big shout out to Tony Wiggins, also daily host of Locked on Jaguars, for holding it down for the way that it should be with the New Orleans Saints and Jameis Winston moving forward. So here's the conversation. Baker Mayfield would be a better option for the New Orleans Saints than Jameis Winston. And that statement is unequivocally false. It is absolutely false. And I've seen it all over the place. You've seen it. If you're talking about replacing a player, a quarterback, that first of all, you have guaranteed money invested in for this year. No, the contract is not a contract that tells you that Jameis Winston is going to be in New Orleans for a long time. That's what happens when a quarterback is coming off of an ACL injury or a player is coming off of an ACL injury, an injury that could end up being re-injured, an injury that could cause an injury to the opposite leg of the same severity all of that because of the compensation and all these other things. So yes, you can look at Jameis Winston's contract, which is two years, $28 million. And you can say, well, that doesn't look like a long-term commitment because it's not because no team is going to give a long-term commitment to any quarterback at this point and in this situation. That's what 2022 is for. But to say that they should just cash Jameis Winston aside because you don't understand that a limp isn't a big deal at this stage in his recovery for Baker Mayfield, who hasn't really done much. And I'm going to tell you why I think Jameis is a better fit than Baker, because that's a huge part of the conversation as well, is just kind of ridiculous, if I'm being honest. Like, that's not even about trying to look for the better fit for the team. That's just because you don't like Jameis Winston. And that's fine. If you're somebody that doesn't like Jameis Winston or you don't trust Jameis Winston, fine. Not a lot of quarterbacks go out there and throw 30 interceptions in a season. I get it. But also not a lot of quarterbacks go out there and throw 20 interceptions in a season. And that's exactly what Baker did in 2019, the same season. But we ain't talking about that, are we? We're not talking about the fact that um, that Baker Mayfield has never thrown for more than 3,700 yards or thereabouts in his career. We're not talking about the fact that Baker Mayfield is not the same type of leader that's going to generate the same type of buy-in that Jameis Winston is, are we? No, we're talking about 30 interceptions from four seasons ago or three seasons ago, whatever, for a quarterback paired in his first year with a head coach in Bruce Arians who is notorious for creating a quarterback's first year as their highest interception total of their career with that coach. But we're not talking about that, are we? We're not talking about 5,100 yards, are we? No, we're still talking about 30 interceptions in a system that doesn't matter anymore. That's what we're talking about. And I just honestly think that's ridiculous. Like if we're gonna, if we're gonna put everything on that, then why aren't we talking about the fact that 
Baker had that 21 uh, uh, interception season. The fact that Baker had one, and you know what? It, it, sorry. You know what else, what also happened that season? 21 interceptions and a, another losing record for the Cleveland Browns and for Baker Mayfield. Yo, know was on that team? Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham Jr. You can't tell me that it wasn't the supporting system. You can't tell me that it wasn't something, you know, that, that, that things just didn't work out. Like, what are we doing here? Genuinely, what are we doing here? So for me, if you want to look at who's the better fit, you go and watch any press conference you want with Jameis Winston and the New Orleans Saints, and then go and watch any press conference in that same time span of Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns and tell me which one you want to be your quarterback. Like, we're not just going to sit here and pretend that there's not intangible leadership things and elements that we shouldn't be taking into account as well. You want to go beyond that? Sure. Beyond that 30 interception season, what's the mark? What's, what's the knock? What about last season? What about those first seven games with the New Orleans Saints and what we saw 14 interceptions and I'm sorry, 14 touchdowns and three interceptions? What about that? What about the fact that he opened up in this first ever season with the New Orleans Saints as a starting quarterback with five touchdowns against the Green Bay Packers? No, we want to write that off and call it a fluke. Do we call Baker Mayfield's four interception, uh, four interception game to end the season? Or what was it, his penultimate game to end the season last year? Do we want to call that a fluke too? Or are we going to, or are we going to give these things th- the same weight? It's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. And I'm not even somebody that doesn't like Baker Mayfield. I like Baker Mayfield. And I'm going to tell you two reasons that Baker Mayfield could actually fit, but there's only two specific scenarios in which it happens. So I'm not even here to like cast doubt on Baker Mayfield or to talk bad about Baker Mayfield. But if the conversation here is take on a project quarterback who needs to revitalize his career when you already have money invested at the quarterback position, you've already developed, you spent the entire offseason so far, if you're the New Orleans Saints, developing culture for your team, and then you're just going to cast away your quarterback that everyone loves, that doesn't make any sense. Like, there's all of the intangible sort of aspects of this that the people that aren't close to the organization don't understand and don't take into consideration. They just go, oh, well, he threw 30 interceptions once, so this other quarterback's better. That's it. That's your dividing line. And if that's your dividing line, you don't have an argument. I'm sorry. You don't. Okay. I'm done with my rant around this topic. I want to talk now nice. I want to be nice for a little while. So... Let's talk about two scenarios in which Baker Mayfield could actually make sense if he hits the market. There's reports saying that they won't, that the Browns won't cut him, that they want to trade him. To me, that makes him immediately untouchable. But what about in the future, right? What if something goes wrong? That's what we'll break down as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. I said I wanted to continue to be nice. I want to be nice. I want to be positive right now. So let me tell you about something very positive happening. And it's Built Bar because they've got granola bars now. Yeah, we asked for it and they delivered. And my goodness, are they fantastic. Built Granola Bars are here and they come in three delicious flavors. There's chocolate peanut butter, my favorite. There's also chocolate coconut. And if you want something a little bit different, there's white chocolate berry as well. So if you want to try all three flavors, you can just get a Built Granola Bar sample box. You could try all of them. These are awesome. And they're a little bit different than the usual Built Bars or the Built Puffs, right? These are chock full of granola, but they're still covered in 100% chocolate, still giving you all of that protein as well. In fact, you're talking about only 150 calories, 15 grams of protein in these bars, only four grams of sugar. So they're a really healthy snack to pack and snack on throughout the day. Maybe you're on a road trip, something like that. And you're just looking, or maybe you're looking for, you know, a protein boost on a bike ride or a workout or something like that. These get you all taken care of. So don't miss out. Go and get yours today because built.com has built granola bars now. So go and check them out at built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, so you can get 15% off of your order at built.com. That's promo code LOCKED15, 15% off at built.com. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thank you so much, as always, making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. And hey, we have an important favor to ask you here at Locked on. We have a survey ready that's going to take into your account and take into it take into account your thoughts on uh, what you think, what you like, what you don't like about our Locked On podcast, my podcast, all of that. So just head over to LockedOnPodcasts.com slash survey so that you can take that and give us all of your thoughts so that we can continue to boost the quality of our shows. And you also get a chance to win 
$100 uh, a ticket master gift card as well so you can get to one of those Saints games this season as well. So once again, that is LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you so much for your help. Okay. So we just talked about how absurd the idea of casting aside Jameis Winston in favor of Baker Mayfield is, but is there a world in which Baker Mayfield actually makes sense? And here's why I'm talking about this. The reason why I'm talking about this is because I am not a hater of Baker Mayfield. I want Baker Mayfield to get another opportunity, and I think that he will. I think it should be in Seattle or Carolina, personally. Well, Carolina doesn't make so much sense anymore, but Seattle still makes a ton of sense because there's no way they're comfortable with Drew Locke and Geno Smith. It just doesn't make sense. So for me, the scenario in which Baker Mayfield does make sense for the New Orleans Saints, there are two, is if he's cut, and this was something that James Rapine over at Locked On NFL uh, highlighted as well, that if he's cut, what basically happens is that he gets to kind of stick it to Cleveland. He has an offset, he has offset language in his contract, which means that if he goes out there and let's say he's owed, what, $18.5 million this season. So if he goes out somewhere and he signs a $1.5 million contract, Cleveland's on the hook for the remaining $16 million. So Baker can kind of stick it to Cleveland by uh, coming in, signing somewhere on a vet minimum deal, but still getting paid. But Cleveland's got to pay the bill. So that's something that I like. So let's say that the New Orleans Saints get partway through training camp and something happens with Andy Dalton or something happens with Ian Book and they need another quarterback in the room behind Jameis Winston. Then I think that Baker Mayfield makes a ton of sense. That's an easy scenario to point out, right? You want to bring him in so that he can be a backup just in case maybe the injury causes problems for Jameis. Would you rather go to Baker Mayfield for a game or two, or would you rather go, or, you know, potentially more, but we're not going to put that out into the ethos. We're not going to put that voodoo out there. Or, or would you rather go to Andy Dalton for a couple of games? I'd rather go to Baker Mayfield for a couple of games. That's a space where I look at Baker and I go, okay, that makes sense. Now, can Baker run Jameis's offense and push the ball downfield the way that Jameis can? No, but could Baker run a short, quick pass, West Coast, short intermediate area offense that has Michael Thomas and some of these other you know, big weapons in it? Probably. I mean, again, the 2019 season tells you otherwise, but the 2020 season, which was a fantastic season for Baker, tells you something different. So which one are you getting? Can you support him? That would make sense. So would I feel more comfortable going to Andy Dalton for a couple of games or Baker Mayfield for a couple of games? The obvious answer there, for me at least, is Baker Mayfield. The other scenario that makes sense is next season, if Jameis doesn't work out, if things go south with Jameis for any reason, whether it be injury related, whether it be a, you know, a, a season that they feel wasn't up to par with what the expectation was, because let's face it, Jameis is on uh, in effectively a wait and see contract right now to where if he goes out there and balls out, which I think he will in 2022, he certainly has the weapons to do it. He has the skill set to do it. He can see clearly now he got the LASIK surgery, all these things, all those things make him a better quarterback. We saw that last year, better decision maker, all of that. He's been working on a shorter intermediate game. Alvin Kamara out the backfield, like who, by the way, was Jameis's most targeted player in 2021 after everyone was like, oh, well, he's not going to throw to Alvin Kamara anymore. So get rid of Alvin Kamara and all your fantasy leagues. That ended up being the exact opposite of the truth. So you look at all of those things in favor of Jameis. I think that he will ball out in 2022. But if something goes wrong and Baker goes off and has, you know, another mediocre season in Seattle, then, yeah, maybe you call up Baker next offseason and say, hey, come through. Right. But I don't think you're trading draft assets for this guy. I don't think you're doing that because you're downgrading from Jameis Winston, in my opinion, in terms of replacing him. But. If there's a situation to where you need that extra backup, something happens to Andy Dalton, something happens to Ian Book, or you just like Baker more than you like Andy Dalton as a backup, Baker's not going to run you for a bunch of cash when he hits the market if the uh, Cleveland Browns cut him because Cleveland's on the hook for the rest of his contract. Either way, Baker gets paid. Baker gets paid no matter what, and Cleveland might have to pay most of that bill whether they want to trade him or not. Either way. So that's where it makes sense for me, right? If you can bring him in as a backup so that you have an option in case things go you know, uh, wrong with Jameis's injury or anything like that, you bring him in next year if you're in search or back in the quarterback market next year, those are the two scenarios. But I don't think that you upset what you've generated, which is a very, very positive culture in New Orleans right now and, for, and within that New Orleans Saints organization. 
that could have all gone south very, very quickly. But the New Orleans Saints, the front office, Dennis Allen, Mickey Loomis, Kai Hartley, all these guys, they did such a phenomenal job building up this team, building up culture, and supporting the culture and connection between the organization and the city with players from the city. Jarvis Landry, Tyron Matthew. To take all of that and cast it aside by upsetting that quarterback room just doesn't make sense. But there are ways and scenarios in which it can, but not the one that equates you replacing Jameis Winston with Baker Mayfield. And for those listening on the audio side, I used air quotes when I said replacing because I don't think there's a comparison between the two. Jameis Winston's the better quarterback. Coming up next, in order for any quarterback to be successful, you have to have a good offensive line in front of you. Do the New Orleans Saints have the best offensive line in the NFC South? We continue our conquest to be able to answer that question. Now we look at the numbers, the raw data, the percentages, the pressures, the sacks, the hits, all of that. So we're going to break all of it down and look at the uh, NFC South offensive lines in 2021, what they look like going into 2022, and them numbers. We're going to break it all down as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. You can tell I'm out of breath. You can tell I am a little agitated with this whole conversation and this entire idea, but I love talking about it, and I love talking with you about it every Monday through Friday. I want to tell you about our friends over at betonline.net who make it possible for me to talk to you about it every single day uh, and also make it possible for you to have a ton of fun during the NBA playoffs, for instance, finals. We ain't even talking about playoffs anymore. We're talking about finals. See what I did there, Jim Moore? Shout out. So uh, BetOnline, you can get in on the NBA finals lines as the NBA finals tip off tomorrow on Thursday evening. You can also get in on NFL futures. Jameis Winston right now leading the pack plus 50 plus, plus let me try that again, plus 550. Uh, when it comes to comeback player of the year, shout out, uh, Michael Thomas, not far behind. He's number three there at plus 900, along with Christian McCaffrey. So you want to get in on those. You want to get in on MMA, UFC. They even got esports if that's what you want to do. So go and check them out over at Bet Online. Our friends over there, they'll get you taken care of as they are the number one sports betting uh, destination. So go and check them out. BetOnline.net. Visit on your laptop, your mobile device, wherever, so that you can get in on all the trends and action but online where the game starts let's get it family wrapping up today's episode of locked on saints with a quick look around the nfc south do the new orleans saints have the best offensive line in the nfc south the numbers in terms of raw data which include pressures pass blocking snaps pressure percentage sacks and hits are what we're going to break down and doesn't look too great for the new orleans saints based on 2021 but let's break it down Carolina Panthers is going to be moving ahead very likely with an offensive line that will consist of Ike McQuonu, Brady Christensen, Bradley Bozeman, Austin Corbett, and Taylor Moten. You can kind of picture that as going from left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle, going from left to right. So when we looked at this on Monday, the thing that we broke down were uh, a potential in terms of draft selection, expectation, all of those things, as well as presence. And the New Orleans Saints all together had players that accumulative of 17 years in the same system, um, several snaps together, over 3,000 snaps together. So they were kind of in the lead in terms of presence, or excuse me, in terms of potential with four first round selections and a second round selection on the offensive line going into 2022. But also we're near the top there in terms of what that presence was. I'd probably tie them up with uh, Atlanta has a lot of cohesion, consistency going from last year into this year. Tampa has a lot of, excuse me, Carolina has a lot of experience together uh, in terms of, you know, Taylor Moten, five years in the system, all of that. But New Orleans kind of edged that one out, that conversation. They are not going to edge this conversation out because 2021 was a little rough for the Saints offensive line. So when we look at Carolina's offensive line, uh, based upon all those numbers, we're going to project, not project, but we're using 2021 numbers. So that instead of us just looking at like, oh, how did Carolina's offensive line play last year and then try to equate what it means to add Austin Corbett, Bradley Bozeman, and Ike McQuono in there, let's just look at the numbers, right? So Ike McQuono took his collegiate numbers, his last season at NC State, and then everybody else took last year's NFL numbers. And what you walk away with here is that 120 total pressures allowed amongst those five players over the course of 2,926 snaps. Okay, Ross, those are big numbers. Who cares? Okay, here's you. You care. Here's why. That's a 4% pressure percentage, right? Uh, 14 total sacks allowed across those five players, 17 total hits allowed across those five players. Now, not all these guys played for Carolina last year. We accounted for that in Monday's episode. Now we're just looking at the raw data, right? So let's compare that to New Orleans. 82 pressures allowed. So about 
40 pressures less than the Carolina Panthers on 1,989 snaps, so nearly 1,000 fewer snaps because Andrew Speed only played 150 snaps last year. Eric McCoy only played 433 snaps last year, pass blocking snaps. Um, Ryan Ramchick only played 361 pass blocking snaps. But the pressure percentage there comes out to be about the same, 4%. So the difference hits the raw numbers, right? We mentioned 14 sacks, 17 hits for Carolina. For New Orleans, that's 11 sacks and 12 hits, a better total there. But that's your medium, basically. Those two teams, the Carolina Panthers and the New Orleans Saints, either tie for second or tie for third, depending upon how you look at it. Because Tampa's way ahead here, and Atlanta's way behind. Here, I'm going to save Atlanta for last because to me it's the funniest. But Tampa, let's just get it out of the way. Tampa's numbers are so much better. And it doesn't matter who you plug in at left tackle. If you go with Aaron Stinney, who was an undrafted free agent, all the other stuff, played 52 snaps last year. Or if you plug in Luke Gadecki, who they drafted this year, who the uh, Bucks drafted this year. No matter what, you walk away with only 87 total pressures allowed, which is more than New Orleans, but on 3,336 snaps or 2,963 pass blocking snaps, depending upon who you have playing at left guard. But in either case, you're talking about a 3% pressure rate. That's really good. It's really, really good. And only seven sacks or six sacks, excuse me, only, uh, yeah, seven sacks or six sacks, depending upon who you have at left guard, only 14 hits or 17 hits, depending upon who you have at left guard. Gadecki gave up three hits. Uh, Sinny didn't because he only played 52 snaps in 2021. So Tampa's, in terms of the, the, the raw numbers here, Tampa yeah, has the better offensive line in terms of that, that metric, these metrics. So I would say New Orleans takes the potential and presence, right? Experience together, all that, the cohesion. They take that trophy. They take the potential trophy in terms of having the better players in terms of uh, expectation, right? Four first round picks and a second round selection. But right now, Tampa takes the, the, the numbers conversation, the production conversation on the offensive line for certain. You know who doesn't take that conversation? The Atlanta Falcons. And there are two big time weaknesses on the Atlanta Falcons offensive line. One's at left guard, the other's at right tackle. And that's not great places to have your weaknesses. On 3,199 pass blocking snaps in 2021 for Jake Matthews, Jalen Mayfield, Matt Hennessy, Chris Lindstrom, and Caleb McGarry. The Atlanta Falcons allowed a whopping 187 total pressures. That's a 6% pressure rate. Double that of Tampa. And not only did they allow a lot of pressure, they allowed a ton of sacks and a ton of hits. It wasn't just hurries, right? Where you don't actually get at the quarterback, but you get them to get out of the pocket or you put a little bit of pressure on them before they throw the pass, whatever. 26 sacks across these five players allowed. 45 quarterback hits across these five players allowed. No wonder why. Cam Jordan eats so much when he plays against the Atlanta Falcons. No wonder why Matt Ryan is the quarterback that has, or the, uh, he has sacked Matt Ryan more than any individual defender has ever sacked an individual quarterback. And no wonder why Cam Jordan's heartbroken that Matt Ryan's no longer in the conference, but he's going to get very close, or division, uh, or conference actually. Um, but he's going to get really well acquainted with either Marcus Mariota or Desmond Ritter at this point. Jalen Mayfield alone allowed 11 sacks and 21 quarterback hits in 2021. Yikes. Yikes. Caleb McGarry, nine sacks, 10 quarterback hits. Hysterical. Really funny. Really bad. Really bad stuff for Atlanta. So at least New Orleans isn't in that situation, right? And New Orleans, in terms of what the numbers will look like going into 2022, it depends. Is Andrews, is Andrews Pete healthy? Is Cesar Rees the starter, even, going into 2022? Um, How's Ryan Ramchek's recovery going? Is Trevor Penning ready, right? Like, there's so many question marks around that. So that's what we're going to talk about to wrap this up. This is what we're going to break down to wrap this up are the the narratives, right? What's the the conversation around each of these uh, offensive lines? So far, I've got New Orleans ahead. But man, those raw numbers for Tampa really, really make a big difference and make a big impact. Only 3% pressure rate. And look, when you have a 45-year-old quarterback, you need that. You need that offensive line to be like that. So I'm not super surprised to see these numbers. All right. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to dive into post-June 1 transactions, cuts, trades, all of that. Could any New Orleans Saints players be on the move? 
Could any of them be on their way out now that we're post June 1? How do post June 1 transactions work? We'll break all of it down for you and keep you up to date with everything going on around your New Orleans Saints as we continue on with another episode tomorrow here on Locked on Saints. I appreciate you so much for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out that Locked on NFL podcast. James Rapine might be a little crazy, but it's okay. It's okay. You can still go. You can still go and check them out. You can still go and check us out. Over on the Locked on NFL podcast every single Monday through Friday, less than 30 minutes, everything you need to know around the NFL. I appreciate you so much for making me a part of your day. I'll see you tomorrow for everything else you need in between these episodes. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.